views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening. Welcome to Bronx Talk. This is uh, going to be a very wonderful show. All our shows are wonderful, but this is going to be very unusual. Of course, we're all uh, uh, commandeered to doing our programs from our homes, and I'm in my home. And we thought we would visit with uh, a well-known Bronxite and visit him in his home. And I'm talking about uh, Bobby Sanabria, a uh, seven-time Grammy nominee. Nice to have you with us, Bobby. Nice to be here, but it's an eight-time Grammy. Now. Eight time, oh, we got to change. We got to change it. I'm, I've lost count already. <laughs> um, but uh, for folks who don't know, and, and I'm going to make a list here, and I know I'm going to forget something. Bobby's a drummer, percussionist, composer, arranger, conductor, producer, educator, documentary filmmaker, band leader, radio host, co-director of the Bronx Music Heritage Center, part of Jazz at Lincoln Center's Jazz Academy, as well as the Wild Music Institute at Carnegie Hall. That's probably a partial list. You're probably doing even more, but uh, nice to have you with us. Before we even start, uh, during this particular period of time, we've lost many, many wonderful Bronx sites, but we've also lost musicians, and I know some close to your heart. Why don't we, why don't we just, at least for the moment, memorialize who we've lost? Oh, well, we're talking about colleagues like the great Onaje, Alan Gums, a great pianist, uh, Wallace Rooney, the great trumpet player. We just lost Lee Konitz, the uh, fabulous, legendary alto saxophonist. Uh, I know I'm forgetting some, but, but uh, particularly uh, in, oh, in the Bronx, we've particularly lost uh, three. Uh, the great Ray Mantia, who was on the advisory board of the Bronx Music Heritage Center, where I'm the core artistic director, along with Elena Martinez. Mm -hmm. And we've lost the great Andy Gonzalez, probably the greatest uh, living uh, Latin bass player in terms of salsa and, of course, Latin jazz. This is oh, a very... Alan, Alan Merrill, Alan Merrill. The Alan Merrill, that's right. Composer of I Love, uh, rock, I love and rock and Roll. roll. Just recently lost uh, Professor Joe Torres, uh, the piano who made his bones and came to the public's attention with the great Willie Colon uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, early 70s. So those are just some of the people we've lost. And uh, we feel it here, especially in the Bronx, because the Bronx is the borough of music. Uh, so uh, if anybody's listening out there and doesn't know who these great Bronx sites are, they should definitely look them up. Uh, Bobby, uh, you know, it, our hearts bleed for them and, of course, for all of the um, uh, everybody that we've lost through this. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about the Bronx Music Heritage Center. It's difficult times because, you know, you, you kind of uh, can't do anything, but I understand you're doing virtual programs. Um, this is really one of the most uh, important institutions in the Bronx, isn't it? Yes, we've been around for about eight, nine years, and uh, we're located on 1369 Louis Nine Boulevard right in the heart of the Maury Senior section of the South Bronx. And myself and Elena, we've been programming it, as you well know, with uh, everything that you can imagine in terms of music related to the Bronx experience. So we've had uh, the Garifuna culture represented, the Mexican community, we've had the Jewish community, the Irish community, we've had, of course, the Puerto Rican community, the African-American community, uh, various strains of the Asian community, represented in different concerts, programming that we do. We do, we do film screenings, panel discussions. Uh, we have rehearsals there, et cetera, et cetera. Everything yeah. that you can imagine, a performing arts center, we do it in miniature. But we're very excited because we're moving to a larger place. It's going to be on 162nd Street, right off Melrose Avenue. Uh, the, the Bronx Music Hall, um, of course, uh, time frames are now uh, jumbled up. So it's hard. To, I mean, the, the perspective uh, idea was that they were going to open in the fall. Uh, we'll wait and see. Bobby, um, you, you once told me, and this was during a, a, a sit-down talking program, and I asked you, I'm always interested in a musician's creativity in the muse. What, what you know, 
what what inspires you and you said to me i'm thinking of i, I got a rhythm in my head right now and i really want to pursue that and having you in front of a drum kit uh, i, I want to understand how that works and so you wake up in the morning and and you hear rhythm like you see the world through rhythm I, it really explained a lot to me but i want i want to understand what specifically you were referring to oh, it could be anything as simple as a, uh, an elderly person walking down the street and i see the rhythm of their gait while they're walking down the street and Go ahead. something like this might come up in my head Or you get on the subway, the bus, whatever. I mean, the rhythm of the city is incredible because we have all these cultures in New York City, particularly in the Bronx. That's what we call the borough of music. So it's every day is inspiring for me. Uh, and when you when you do what you just did, do you say to yourself because you always want to be creative, you always want to be original. You have so much music knowledge and so many people that you've you know listened to and respected over the years. Do you say to yourself, um, gee, that wasn't original or I'm doing it like so-and-so and so I want to create, like, do you force yourself to be original or do you allow yourself to adapt from other cultures and other musicians? And, and certainly if you could play a sample, like this is something I learned from so-and-so and how I've interpreted it. Right, well, the thing is, uh, we all, uh, all our lives are based on a fr framework. You learn how to speak from the people closest to you, uh, who was ever raising you at the time, whether it's your parents, grandparents, si you know, like older siblings, et cetera, et cetera. But everybody's an, indi an individual. For, exa uh, for example, I'm going to play for you uh, uh, a rhythm that uh, is uh, a, a standard rhythm that we would use in, in what we call funk, which is a very syncopated form of music from African-American tradition. So I might do something like this. Uh, okay, any hip hop person would recognize something like that. But I might do it like this to give it a little bit more flavor. How much of that is how much of that is technique and how much of that is feel for just knowing how to do it it's both i mean just what i was doing with my left foot i'm imitating a shaker with my left foot so i had to develop the technique to do that you know so uh uh it's i'm very in terms of my playing style i'm very well known for multitasking putting a lot of things together at the same time that normally the average drummer wouldn't do. So to create the aura that there's more people there than just one person playing. So what I was doing with my foot was imitating a shaker with a small little cowbell. I'm imitating the fact that there might be a percussionist playing a cowbell there. And of course, then I'm doing the syncopations between the snare drum, this drum, and the bass drum. So I'm pretty well known for that. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, being on the scene and, and on recordings. So I'm going to do something right now that I don't think I ever told you, and um, it's very relevant. When I was in junior high school, I was a drummer. I learned to play the drums. I was really not very good. When they started, I think by the time we got to double flamadiddles, I was out. I couldn't do it and certainly couldn't coordinate my feet. Um, uh, so I, I, I wanted the, the technique that I learned was to hold the drumsticks like this. Hope everybody can see you hold your drumsticks like this. I was understood that rock drummers do it like this, but jazz drummers use it like this. 
have you ever held your sticks like this or has it always been like well, this? Well, I can't see which I can't see on the you screen see how you're holding them, but I, I can like I, this. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. In rock, funk, etc., we would normally hold our, uh, the sticks like this. Okay, what we call match grip because both hands are matched. Right. You get more power that way. Uh, you can get subtlety and, and finesse, but you can you can really dig into the snare drum too. Now, the traditional way of holding the drumsticks is like this, and this came from uh, revolutionary wartime and also in Europe back in the day uh, <clears throat> during the colonial period, et cetera, and even before that, because when you hold a drum standing up on a sling for marching, it tilts. So you, it'd be more comfortable to play like this instead of. Oh. So it's logical, right? But yeah. that, that's the way traditionally everybody was taught to play. Or if you didn't take formal lessons, you'd see people playing that. So uh, and in terms of that grip, which is called the traditional grip, it lends itself to more subtle types of playing, especially with the left hand when you play jazz. For example, when you play jazz, there's different ways. For example, in the swing era, you would keep time on the bass drum light, uh, lightly. I don't know if you can hear that. Yes. Boom, when you hear that. The hi-hat, which is this, is hitting the two and four. You'd have the beat of swing on the cymbal. And then maybe you do what we call chopping wood. For example, I'll sing an old uh, jazz tune from the 30s. And that and that functioned well for uh, the uh, the time period for dancing, swing dancing, and then. Uh, with the left hand, if you got away from the chopping wood, you would do accents with the brass. Etc. Etc. But in the 1940s, the virtuosity of jazz musicians went to its highest degree, uh, and small group jazz became popular because believe it or not there was a tax imposed by the united states on nightclubs that featured dancing for the war effort to raise money so club owners especially in new york city uh filled up the clubs with seats and tables and now smaller groups were hired instead of big bands and they had to entertain the audiences with what not dance music but instrumental virtuosity so this new form came along developed by dizzy gillespie who i worked with and Charlie Parker, and uh, now you have instrumental virtuos virtuosity. The tunes are more complex; they're angular. You can't really hum them because the, the melodies are very complex. And then, what did drummers what did drummers have to do in that context? What what did what did drummers have to do to to reformat so that they could fit in and on one level play with, and on the other level drive the rhythm? Well. They develop what we call coordinated independence between the left hand and the bass drum so that the bass drum and the left hand can accent any way they wanted to in response to the vocabulary that the horn players were doing. Can and you show us also, what that's like? They could also speak. I'll give you an example. So where a swing drummer would play like this. In
Uh, Bobby, um, you a little and more complex. Uh, well, not a little, but a lot more complex. You, you and I both would like to inspire. Um, maybe if they're watching the program, young people to uh, to play music and to learn to play music. Um, what would you recommend for a youngster who's watching now and is inspired by it, just to get started? What what kind of things should they do, even mentally, to get themselves prepared to learn to play the drums? Well, just don't listen to one style of music. I just like I don't eat the same kind of food every day. <laughs> uh, I you have to you know I I always joke. I mean, eating uh, uh, hamburgers and French fries and uh, and having a, a soda is is fine for comfort food, but it's unhealthy if you do it every day. Uh, uh, and, and you know you're gonna wind up fat with <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. But if you eat a variety of foods, you'll be healthy and you'll be experiencing also at the same time, different cultures. Same, so no. same thing with music. And we have that at our disposal in the, uh, in the Bronx. So don't just listen to hip hop, listen to where the music that we call hip hop today comes from and go back to people like James Brown, uh, who the DNA of hip hop is replete with the rhythms of James Brown's great funky band and the funky drummers that were in the band. Listen to a band like the Meters from New Orleans. Listen to Salsa. The Bronx is known as El Condado de la Salsa. So artists like uh, Ray Barreto, Eddie Palmieri, Charlie Palmieri, uh, the Fania All-Stars. And of course, orchestras like the Machito Orchestra, Tito Puente, and of course, Tito Rodriguez, the greatest orchestras, big bands. So in addition to the skills, it's really important to be educated, to understand where it's from. And, and I always tell people when they're learning TV performance, don't be afraid to imitate somebody. You um, were telling me that when you first started, uh, the first instrument was the congas. Do you want to you pull out the congas and oh, yeah, talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, when I was a kid, you heard congas all the time in the parks uh, in the summertime, not only in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, but in South Brooklyn, in Spanish Harlem, okay? In the playgrounds, in the parks. So what you'd hear at night, starting in the early evening, going into uh, late at night, would be a style of Cuban drumming known as rumba. And one of the rhythms of rumba is guaguancó, and it would sound something like this. I'm gonna be tapping out the main pulse with my left foot on a, on a block. And that's what we call uh, la clave. And then, okay. and rumba, give us a sample of that. We don't have a ton of time, so let's give us a sample okay. of that and we'll uh, let it rip. Okay, here we go. There you go. Bobby, we're uh, just about out of time. And uh, you and I, we could I could listen to you play all night long. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us. And maybe we'll do a part two one day. Hopefully, we'll be able to do it in person instead of uh, having to do it this way. But it is such a joy and a pleasure to even be with you for this short period of time. Thank you so Thanks much for so joining much. us. And to everybody listening out there, don't remember one thing. The virus is only temporary. The music and art is forever. We'll see you. Thanks so much, Bobby. We'll be right back with more.
now we're going to extend the, the notion of uh, Bronx culture to something that I think is real important. We're going to welcome Elena Martinez, who is uh, the co-director of the Bronx Music Heritage Center, and the Madaha Kinsey Lamb, who uh, is uh, the director of uh, Mind Builders Creative Arts Center. So first, Elena, good evening. Nice to have you with us. Hi, Gary. How are you? And also, Madaha, nice to have you with us as well. Um, the reason that uh, we have them both on the program uh, is to um, talk about a folk arts relief fund. And um, I think uh, one of the things that Bobby Sanabria told me a long time ago, he said, you know, it really is Bronx culture that is gonna save us in the long run. It's our music, our arts, our dance, our performance. And so, uh, Elena, why don't you tell me a little bit about what the idea is behind this relief fund? Okay, so um, the Folk Arts COVID-19 Relief Fund um, is sort of um, is a, is an emergency grant um, fund that is created um, by a, a consortium of organizations, City Lore, the Center for Traditional Music and Dance, Bronx Music Heritage Center, Mind Builders, Mano a Mano, and it's under the umbrella of um, this um, this um, consortium that we call this collective called Catch that City Lore and a couple a few other organizations started um, a few years ago, actually by more than a decade ago. And Catch is a center for arts, traditional, and cultural heritage, um, and so that's sort of like the umbrella that all these groups are coming under together to create this relief fund, which will look for. Um, Look for funding through traditional sources as well as using right now a GoFundMe page as well. And the point of this is because um, a lot of the work in these organizations that I mentioned, our kind of the, the work that we do for a lot of our programming um, and, and, and all of our work is, is a lot with folk artists. And it's sort of like our bread and butter to work with a lot of folk artists throughout, the, throughout New York City, the New York City area. So um, the, the point for me that's really important for this grant is that it. Um, there's a lot of these artists sometimes fall through the cracks of like in, in um, mainstream funders. You know, they don't fit into the genres of, um, you know, what we see in, in dance cat and dance funders or for contemporary art. So they kind of fall through the cracks. They don't always fit those um, funding sources. So they're not able to apply for them. And on the other hand, too, a lot of the artists in these in the communities we work with might be from immigrant communities. They might have um, language barriers to applying for some of these applications or technological access, you know, don't have access to online forms and applications. And it's just a harder process. Right. I mean, in, in general, applications online are hard for a lot of people. That's why people hire development right. so, people. So I, I, I want to make sure we don't run out of time. Um, Madaha, we did a program here on uh, Bronx Talk a couple of weeks ago about the difficulties not-for-profits are having right now and, and, and the concerns that they have specifically right now of raising money. Um, just talk to me a little bit about the health, certainly of mind builders, what your concerns are, and then how that relates to your participation to this grant. Yes, um, one of our major programs is community folk culture uh, research and presentation. So the issue that these artists are facing is definitely dear to our hearts as well and really glad to be a part of this coming on board now. Um, it's an incredible time, as everyone says, this roller coaster. Um, Mind Builders closed down the building um, as of March 14th, at the end of that day, that Saturday. And over the next couple of weeks, we've, we have transformed into virtual classes, various musical instruments, various types of dance. We're um, starting up our community folk culture program, uh, interviewing for teens who are interested in doing that research this summer and starting with a, a project right now and they get a stipend, so we are recruiting them. We have drama online, um, martial arts and all of that. So it's been an extremely busy time and challenging and also rewarding. It's quite a mixture of sadness and, and, and appreciation. Uh, talk, about, uh, talk about the importance of uh, doing this, uh, uh, you know, folk art uh, relief fund right now, and and really the importance of culture. I mean, I really think it's heightened because of this, because this is what we have to rely on: our our heritage, yes. our legacy, our yes. art, our culture. I mean, because a lot of the other structures, frankly, are falling down. So, talk from your perspective about why this is so important. I've always loved um, when Dr. Beverly Robinson introduced me to folk culture because I didn't know what it was either and folk art. 
but the art of everyday life and us appreciating the traditions that we have in our community and our family. So we've had students, teenagers and, and uh, folks in the community and in the students' families, so that we've been able to identify musicians and painters, uh, jewelry makers, milliners in the community, uh, drum makers, master hair braiders and barbers, things that uh, they may have learned as they were growing up or that they became masters of and now um, are examples for others for that profession. And they do, as Elena said, um, really fall through the cracks. I mean, this is to be able to provide survival money. Um, it's not a tremendous amount, but we're definitely looking for donations on this website to help support the urgent need that these traditional artists and folk artists have right now in the Bronx. Yeah, and I really think uh, and, and really, really, city, I should say New York sense, City and throughout the city. Uh, I really think this is really the the core of the Bronx, and you know, I hate to put it this way. If you can't support this, you know, it's like what else can you support? This really is uh, what what drives this borough. What gives? The, I hate to use the word gives the borough soul. It gives it its character. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the Folk Arts Relief Fund, uh, Elena, before we run out of time, um, just uh, talk about some of the specifics. Uh, the money will come in. Where does it go? How does it work? For now, right now, the, the first component, the first step is the GoFundMe page, which I think you have the GoFundMe page, but also people can go to the website, catch, C-A-T-C-H-N-Y-C.net and donate there. And even though we only put a limit of 10,000, we want to still take donations because we're we're reaching our goal, but we want to still take donations so we can are able to have as much funds as possible to disseminate to different artists. The application for artists will be um, will be will be getting out to them in the next week or so. And then hopefully then and then a few weeks after that we'll be able to um, get start getting the funds out to the artists themselves. For me, the bottom line, of course, is the bottom line, but the, but it really is important to um, uh, it's people giving to people, you know, it, it's not like giving to corporate structures or anything like that. It's really, uh, you know, giving to Bronx people who are contributing um, to all of our cultures. I think, I think it's great. Elena Martinez, thank you so much for your uh, appearance this evening and your dedication to the concept and Madaha Kinsey Lamb, great work with mind builders. The work never stops. Doesn't matter what format, we just do it, right? Is that, right. Let's just say catchnyc.net one more time. <laughs> Let's keep it up. Thank you both for joining us. And uh, thanks, of course, to Bobby Sanabria for his uh, great, great performance and opening up his, uh, his own home uh, to us this evening. And uh, thanks to our producers, Helen Greenberg, Michael Max, and uh, Carl Peters put together these electronic concepts so we can do these programs virtually. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Good night.